Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all-mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. And, and for those of you who want to know how you can get one of your questions or comments, whatever, on our show, whether it's Mailbag or AMC Movie Talk Monday through Friday, you can send us an email anytime at this address right here you see below me, at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Just send in your question to us. Now, we get like a 1,000 questions a week. So, I mean, obviously, we can't guarantee your question will get on, but send them on in, and you never know. Your question may pop up on either AMC Movie Talk or AMC Mailbag. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News. Thank you so much for joining us. I am pleased to be here, but I'm also doubly pleased to be joined by AMC's Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, John? And uh, we are ready to kick things off here. Let's get into question number one. And the first question today comes to us from, wow, okay, um, Kevin Balakrishan. Balakrishan. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, Kevin. Forgive me. I'm terrible at this. Anyway, greetings and salutations, sons and daughters of AMC. I love the show and I watch it constantly. Thanks so much, Kevin. Really appreciate that. My question is, why are there so few pirate movies or movies like Master and Commander? Have the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise hurt the business? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Well, you know what? Actually, this reminds me an awful lot of when um, Lord of the Rings first came out. Because when Lord of the Rings first came out, the era of the fantasy Dungeons and Dragons, sword and sorcery kind of film had been very thin and very weak. And then along came Lord of the Rings. And a lot of people started to speculate, hey, with the success of Lord of the Rings... Now it'll open the floodgates for a lot more these types of films to come out. But what actually happened was that I think a lot of the studios became fearful that if they made a sword and sorcery film, that it would be compared to Lord of the Rings and negatively compared to Lord of the Rings, that they couldn't make something that lived up to Lord of the Rings. And what actually happened was the opposite happened, is that the greatness and the success of Lord of the Rings, I think, kind of quashed the idea of sword and sorcery movies for a while. So now you look at Pirates of the Caribbean. Obviously, the first Pirates of the Caribbean is really good. Since then, uh, people have not loved Pirates of the Caribbean. I think that's fair to say. Right. And I, I think... What happens, though, is that I think because Pirates is kind of a unique thing, it's a very niche thing, I still think studios might be a little fearful that if they make a Pirates movie of some kind, it might be just called a Pirate. It could just be perceived as a big Pirates of the Caribbean ripoff, as fair right. or as unfair as that might be. Now, I don't know that for a fact. I'm just speculating, but it seems to make sense that a lot of the studios have not tried to venture into those uncharted waters, if you pardon the pun, to get involved in pirate films because they're afraid it's just going to look like and be perceived as a big Pirates of the Caribbean ripoff. And none of them are going to be able to replicate a Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow. I mean, so as bad as those movies have been, I mean, he's still Captain Jack. So I, I think, yeah, I think Pirates of the Caribbean has hurt the pirate genre, if you will, in that sense. At least until we haven't had a new Pirates film for a bunch of years. Anyway, Schnepp, how do you see it? Well, yeah, I think what it did is it took... Uh, it, it, it's a divisive film because it's a family film about pirates. So, I mean, if you look at the history of what a pirate is, it has nothing to do with family fun and adventure. It's about raping and pillaging and murder. Yeah, it's, we're not talking it, about people who download the latest album of Coldplay. Right. It's, you know, yeah, Pirates of the Caribbean is like a very fun adventure, and it's got, like, colorful pirates like, you know, Jack Sparrow and all this... So it's, even though it's got some darkness and crazy mystery and fantasy, obviously lots of fantasy, um, it, it, Master and Commander is an interesting one to, to mention. It's, it's a great film. I mean, I don't think we're going to get films like that, especially with pirates involved, for uh, the foreseeable future. Can we see some amazing films about pirates? I'd love to see an incredible movie about Sir Francis Drake. Uh, he's a pirate. I'm re I'm a direct relative of his, but unfortunately, I don't own the Drake Hotel or anything like that. But that's a character right there. He's worked for the Queen, sunk ships, got the gold. I mean, but that's real. So I mean, they're, pirates are a real thing, and it, it would be great to see some actual biopics about real pirates that would be R-rated. 
you run the risk though of like you know is it going to be you know dr- you know is it going to get that money back if you spend a hundred million dollars on making a giant pirate movie? So do you have to get the family involved? Do you have to make it like you know spooky skeletons and like ghosts floating around with pirates? Are you know? <laughs> I mean that's that's a risk that someone's going to have to take. But I think the pirate genre has not been uh, exploited at all, and it's r- it's ripe for the pickings. You, you know, know what's funny too is. There was that Gina Davis movie. I think it was called Cutthroat Island. Yep. I was trying to remember what it was called. I wrote down Treasure Island. I was like, it's not that. I can't remember what it was called. But yeah. Yeah. That, and I think wasn't... Um, Matthew Modine. Matthew Modine was in that. Frank Ligello was in that, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yep. Rennie Hartland already, directed it. And and you know what? I, to me, my my all-time, you know, all due respect to, to uh, the Pirates of Penzance, my all-time favorite pirate movie, if you can call it that, it's still going to be the Princess Bride. I mean, with the with the Dread Pirate Roberts and the new sure. the new Dread Pirates Rob, Roberts. I mean, maybe that's not a pirate a proper pirate movie. It has pirate elements in it. Pirate Just elements, yeah. Ice Pirates has pirate elements in it. Ice with Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> it's a space drama about eighty you know? percent. No, ninety yeah. percent of our audience have no idea what movie we're talking about when we say that's Ice right. Pirates. Like it goes <laughs> back a ways. That's back when you and I were just like little kids. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the Ice Pirates. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if this is a genre that at some point and in some way can be revitalized because it's there's a lot of epic uh, high sea adventures that could be told, man. So I like to see somebody take a crack at it. All right. Let's get on to the next question. And the next question today, uh, we already did the one from Kevin. The next question today comes to us from Joseph Current, who writes, Hey, guys, I love your show and watch it every day. Thanks a lot, Joseph. My question is about typecasting. Now, obviously, an actor has to have some level of success to be in enough films that they become typecast, but sometimes this hurts the actor's chances of being in other movies and limits them to the same small role time and time again. Michael Cera, Cameron Diaz, Jennifer Aniston. Other times, it immortalizes them into iconic roles for the rest of their career. Harrison Ford, Will Ferrell, Morgan Freeman. Thoughts on if slash when typecasting is good or bad? Well, um, I'll agree with you on the Michael Sarah thing. I think he has kind of been typecast. I don't know about Cameron Diaz, though. She's been in a lot of very different types of films and has played a lot of very different kinds of characters. Like, her character in Something About Mary is infinitely different from her character in Being John Malkovich. You know, which is infinitely different from her character in, you know, The Counselor, which is infinitely different from her character in, you know, and the list goes on. I don't think Cameron Diaz has ever really been typecast yet. Michael Sarah, I see it. But then even the positive ones, Harrison Ford, I, I don't think you can say Harrison Ford's been typecast. I mean, you look at the range of characters he's played from president of the United States to, you know, it's just. He's played a very wide range of characters, and and I don't think we can say he's been typecast. Same with Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman's played a lot of different kinds of dudes, from drama to comedy, from all around the spectrum. Um, So can typecasting be a good thing? Yes. I mean, it can be. You look like at a guy like um, uh, 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 Evil Dead. um, Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell. He's made a career out of typecasting, man. Uh, yeah. But yes, sometimes it can hurt. I, I think uh, Mark Hamill got typecast very early in his career just from Star Wars. Right. He and, couldn't break out of being Luke Skywalker. Yeah. So he very creatively found a way to etch a, a new kind of career for himself doing a lot of other different things. Like Voice when you're over. really yeah. smart, you can do that. But it takes somebody pretty smart to do it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that typecasting is nest. In general, it's not a good thing. There are some exceptions like a Bruce Campbell. But I think overall, it can be a, it can be a bad thing for an actor if they can't break out of that. You know, Harrison Ford was able to with a pure on-screen acting career. Carrie Fisher wasn't able to. So, right. uh, so sometimes success can hurt you. And you know what? I'm still not convinced that uh, uh, Daniel Radcliffe. I I'm, I still haven't seen evidence that Daniel Radcliffe has been able to break out of Harry Potter. We've seen him in a couple of films, but still, public perception is he hasn't had a big hit. Outside right. of Potter, and when now when you say Daniel Radcliffe, people still think Potter. Whereas, like an Emma Watson, she's already starting to break out of the Harry Potter mold, right? right? So it can be a very difficult thing, and I think in general it's a bad thing for an actor. Schnepp, how do you see it? Well, you mentioned Radcliffe. I mean, his movie where he's got these horns, horns. growing out of it's his called. head. I think it's called Horns. Yeah. 
Um, that hasn't come out yet, but he's a little bit older. So I think, can he break out of being Harry Potter? Yes, eventually he can. It's going to take a little bit, and he's got to be in a bunch of bigger movies and a supporting role, not maybe the lead, but in some different... That's what happens with actors, like all the Star Trek actors, like William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, McCoy, uh, um, DeForest Kelly. Um, see, I, even I called him McCoy, because he's yep. typecast in my mi- mind. Oh, Scotty. Bones. Scotty. I mean, it's Walter Koenig. He's Chekhov. It's like... Those guys, you know, they had it really rough in the 70s because not only was their show canceled, but it was in constant reruns. That's how I saw it. It was in constant reruns. So no one was going to think about them as anything else other than, dude, you're Kirk. Shatner, you're Kirk. He had a, he, I mean, Kirk, Shatner was able to break out out of all of them. TJ Hooker. He, yeah, he was TJ <laughs> Hooker. So him, like, if you look at, like, let, let's say Shatner and Ford, they were able to burn themselves into the public with a different character. Like, Harrison Ford was able to be Indiana Jones only a few years after he was Han Solo. So, and a very popular character, Indiana Jones. So then people differentiated him not only as one, but he was like, oh, he can act as bo- both of these characters. So now it's okay for him to be, you know, in a clear and present danger or, you know, in a bunch of these other movies. You see what I'm saying? It's yeah, like you know, the Harrison out. Ford thing, here's the really fascinating thing about Harrison Ford. The fact that he was able to get Indiana Jones, I, and I think the first Indiana Jones came out before uh, Return of the Jedi, did it not? Yes. I'll have to look it up. But it did. He was able to jump onto another major franchise and be another very character very, very early, and that, I mm. think, saved him. Because think about this. We all think of Harrison Ford. It's not just Indiana Jones and Han Solo. He has had multiple Academy-nominated roles. He's been in a lot of different stuff, and he's been really successful. But had Tom Selleck not walked away from Indiana Jones, because a lot of people forget Tom Selleck got the role of Indiana Jones. He was signed. He was on. He was going to be Indiana Jones until a previous commitment to doing this new TV show that was coming out called Magnum P.I. made him walk away, and then Lucas went with this guy he knew, you know, Harrison Ford, and history was made. What would Harrison Ford's career have looked like had Tom Selleck not left Indiana Jones? It's That's weird a, to think about. It's a, I don't know if he would have been cast as uh, Rick Deckard in Blade Runner, to be honest with you. Yeah. Remember Rick Dustin Hoffman was going to be Rick Deckard in Blade Runner all the way up until like two months before they shot it. So they they got Harrison Ford pretty quickly. Um, uh, One of the ones I wrote down was uh, uh, George Reeves and Christopher Reeves. They were both kind of typecast as Superman. Yeah. One of them in the 50s, he could not break out and do other roles because people just saw him so clearly as the TV icon superhero Superman. So it made it really difficult for him as an actor to ever do anything else. Christopher Reeves, the same thing. He tried to do other films. People just didn't want to see him as anything other than Superman. That's a that's a hard one to you know to break. And uh, Christopher Reeve was actually ended up being in a film. Depending on what day you ask me, a, a film I usually rank as either my number one, number two, or number three. It's always in my top three all time favorite comedy films. It's a film he did with Michael Caine, John Ritter, Carol Burnett. It's called Noises Off. Mm. It is. Absolutely one of the best comedies I think ever made in history. And Christopher Reeve is one of the big reasons why it was so good. But you're right. Even as I'm watching that film, who do I see? I see Clark Kent. And that's hard. And comedians especially get typecast. Like when you think of Jim Carrey, you don't think of him as a serious actor. And a lot of comedians I know just are always like, when will they get allow me to take me seriously? It's like, well, you kind of burned yourself into the public as being like a funny person. And that's why you're successful and popular is because people like they like to laugh when they see you. They're not laughing at you, which most comedians are very insecure and have problems like they, you know, I want them to be laughing with me or like I'm, you know, they, they can't see that it's like. The whole thing about your personality is what they love and that you're, you're making them laugh. I can so they want to be taken two, serious. I can only think of two guys who were absolutely 100% known as comedy guys that were then really significantly break out and be recognized dramatically. One is Tom Hanks. Right. Uh, a lot of people forget that his he Bosom was just buddies. all spoofy comedy, man. Yeah. And uh, Robin Williams. Um, Jim Carrey's had some success. Uh, obviously he's had some success dramatic, but he hasn't been able to break through that wall right. like a Hanks and a Robin Williams. It's very rare. 
Very yeah, Ben Stiller team. hasn't yeah, Ben Stiller hasn't broken through really. I mean, he did that permanent midnight, which was like, ah, oh, it was cool. Yep. But we still think of him as, you know, hey, when let's when's the next funny film coming out? So Where's Zoolander 2, damn it? <laughs> That's right. All right, let's move on to the third question today. And the third question today comes to us from Cody Weiss, who writes Hey, guys, uh, you're awesome. Keep it up. Thanks so much, Cody. Uh, my question is with the success of Monsters University, do you think we will see an actual sequel to Monsters, Inc. in the future now? I enjoyed Monster University, but missed Boo's character. Thanks, guys, and bring on the filthy. I'll be honest with you. I was When I heard they were doing another Monsters movie, I wasn't surprised. What I was surprised was that they were doing a prequel. Um... I, I didn't see that coming. Didn't want to see it coming either. Um, not big on prequels, but you guys know that. But, you know, I enjoyed Monsters University. It was a nice movie. It was, a, it was fun. It was entertaining. It was charming. Was it as good as Monsters, Inc.? No. But it was still a, it was a worthy movie. I will say it was worthy of the Pixar name. Pixar has put out a couple of films that I would say are not worthy of the Pixar name. Right. I would say Monsters U was worthy of the Pixar name, even though it, you know it's it's not in the top echelon of, of Pixar films. About moving forward now, do you do a monster a proper Monsters Inc. sequel? With Pixar moving into they're not doing it this year or next year, but in 2016, I believe we're gonna start seeing two Pixar films a year. Once you get into that realm, a third Pixar or a third Monsters film becomes possible. I would love to see Boo, you know, two or three years older. Maybe, or, you know, maybe she's getting ready to go off to college herself at some point. I still think it would have been cool in Monsters U, though, Schnepp. Had they told the story of Monsters U from the point of view that Sully and Mike are talking to Boo as she's getting ready to go to college and they tell them her their experience of going to college. I thought that would have been pretty cool. That's a great idea. Yeah, but uh, I on it, doing two films a year, they're going to need content. I will go out on a limb and say yes, they will do eventually another Monsters film. I'm not ready to die for that belief, but I'm going to guess yes. Anyway, Schnapp, what do you think the chances are of another Monsters film? Well, uh, I did not see Monsters University because I didn't like the idea of them going backwards. I mean, I love Monsters, Inc. So when I heard they were making a Monsters, Inc. sequel, I was all for it. When I saw the first trailer and it was like based in college, I, I was turned off. So I didn't want to see it. And then when I saw Muppets Most Wanted, they have a five minute tr little short based in the Monsters University world. And I kind of fell in love with it, and I was like, "Oh my God!" Now I want to see Monsters University. So I'm looking. I'm going to see that in the next, probably the next two weeks. I'll finally see it. Do I love those characters? Would I like to see a third movie? I would. I would love to see them do a progressive story as opposed to a prequel. But I'm going to check out Monsters University. So will they actually use those characters again? They should. Everyone loves them. So I would see it as kind of money in the bank as far as like from a movie standpoint. All right, let's move on to the fourth question today. And the fourth one today comes to us from Nori Wequiem II, <laughs> who writes, Hey guys, love the show and uh, of you and love you guys on it. I was looking up online stuff about uh, Disney's upcoming project and stumbled across a project set for December this year called Into the Woods. I'm very interested in the casting and premise, but want to know what you guys thought about it. Is it simply a dark fairy tale rehash, or perhaps does it have Disney's hands, If or is it perhaps in Disney's hands something special? Schnepp, we were talking about Into the Woods uh, coming up. Like, what, what do you know about the film, and um, what are you looking forward to it? What are your thoughts on it? I am actually looking forward to it, and that Johnny Depp's in it. So this could be a good turn for him if this is a big hit. Um I don't know what I don't know the take on it yet though. I mean, I've heard it's a musical. I mean, it's based on a stage play. Yeah, so I'm really interested in, in in I can't wait to see the trailer drop, so to speak, you know, like I'm really I'm really looking forward to seeing the visual take on this because like something like Maleficent, every trailer has gotten better and better where I'm like, wow, now I'm really excited to see that movie. When I saw the first trailer from Maleficent, not so much. Now I'm 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 excited to see it opening weekend. Uh, for Into the Woods, I need to see a trailer. I mean, I've seen a few pictures which look really fantastic and interesting. The characters look very bizarre and fantasy-filled. So 
I need to see some visual movement happening. Trailer. So, um, it's it. What is else is interesting about the film? It's being directed by is it Gary Marshall? Uh, Gary Marshall, who directed Chicago. Uh, oh wow, did, awesome! Rob yeah, Marshall. Rob Marshall. Rob thank Marshall. you. Rob Marshall's directing it. Uh, he also directed like the last, I believe, the last Pirates of the Caribbean film. I believe that was his as well. It's an interesting thing. You got Johnny Depp. You got Chris Pine. You got Anna Kendrick. You got Meryl Streep. You got Emily Blunt. Um, I bl- if I think I heard Tracy Ullman's in it too. Wow. I mean, so Great and, cast. and it's, it's just played. And I believe Johnny Depp like plays the big bad wolf. Um, Anna Kendrick plays Cinderella. So it, yeah, it is kind of a dark fairy tale, different look, kind of like a grim sort of uh, approach and view of it. I I I'm like you. I'm not really sure what to think about it yet. The cast is spectacular. You've got a skilled director there who has experience working with Johnny Depp, although I wasn't thrilled with the results of that collaboration originally. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm with you on this. I got to see something from it first to get a sense of the, the tone and the direction of it. Uh, and once I do, I and it's coming out in December, so you got to figure probably within the next 90 days, we'll probably see some kind of teaser drop. Um, right. At, at, at that point, and then we'll probably have a better idea about what we're dealing with. But I'm very curious, super curious about this film. All right, let's move on to the fifth question today. And the fifth question today comes to us from Joe G, who writes, Hey, guys, I love the show. Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, why did Cap have so much trouble fighting that bad guy on the ship at the beginning of Winter Soldier? He's talking about Batroc, played by uh, w, or, or UFC fighter uh, George St. Pierre. Greatest super soldier of all time versus a talented martial artist? It just didn't make sense to me uh, and had me annoyed from the start of the film. How was this not on your negative list? Well, I, Joe, I can kind of see why you bring that up. But honestly, look, how many action films have we seen where a significantly smaller and less physically strong female action hero whether it's like Elektra or whether it's Black Widow or whether it's, you know, um, I don't know, uh, Jennifer Garner in Alias or whether it's, you know, anything like that. How many times have we seen in a movie or TV show where a clearly physically smaller and less uh, strength-wise, less powerful than a bigger, physically stronger male opponent, but the female hero has no problem taking them out? Well, think about it in that terms, because what you have with Captain America fighting Batroc in that movie in George St. Pierre, yes, Captain America is physically stronger and probably a bit faster than uh, than uh, Batroc is. But Batroc is a world class martial artist. He is the more skilled fighter. And therefore, that's why Captain America would have a little bit of problem because it's like Black Widow fighting a bigger guy, right? But Black Widow is the more skilled fighter, so we we see her prevail. But really, if you really think about it and watch that fight again, Captain America doesn't really have too much trouble with Batroc. I mean, the the fight lasts a little bit. There's a lot of exchanges, but it's not like Batroc ever had Captain America hurt, except for when he threw a grenade at him. It's not like um, it was a back and forth fight. It Captain America didn't have too much trouble with him. Uh, but remember, it's it's like the Black Widow fighting a bigger, larger guy. The more powerful guy versus the more skilled fighter. And that's what you had in Batroc versus Captain America. Anyway, Schnepp, you saw the film. I, you yeah. saw it multiple times, I think. What did you think? Did you have a problem with that fight? You know, it's funny he brings that up because the first time I saw it, I, I, it irked me a little bit because I, I was like, look, Cap's the super soldier. They're not going into uh, giving Batroc any kind of like superpowers. He's just a dude in this movie. Uh <laughs> But, you know, when you watch Cap take him out, I mean, he's sort of like, oh, what, do you have to hide behind your shield? So Cap's sort of like, all right. He's kind of like, let's let's have a little workout. I looked at it like that. Like Chris Evans, uh, Steve Rogers is sort of like, all right, I'll fight you normal style. I'm still going to win and not break a sweat, basically, <laughs> but let's see what you got. So he brings a little bunch of flippy kicks to him, gets one or two hits in, and Cap nails him. So it's it's not really like a big deal, and they, they definitely didn't make a big deal out of Batroc. They didn't play him up. I think they said his name twice in the whole movie. So, yeah, he's a jumpy, flippy dude. You know, he's one of those parkour guys is how they kind of portrayed him. They didn't make him – they didn't really build him up to be like some ultimate badass, and he definitely wasn't. Could he handle handle Cap in a fight? No. But, he you know, he could hold his own a little bit, gave Cap a little workout. I think Cap was bored. He was like, all right, 
jumpy flippy kick guy come at me you know yeah. i don't i'll put my shield down for five See, seconds i would have had a problem if it was like a back and forth battle where he lands some big shots on batrock but then batrock nails him and gets him hurt and down in the corner and is beating on him and cap has to come back from that yeah then i would have had a problem with it but right really you're right schnapp he didn't even really he didn't break a sweat he was fighting yeah. a superior skilled fighter and didn't break a sweat because he's the super soldier and right. uh that's why I didn't have a problem with it. All right, let's move on to the last question today. And the final question today comes to us. We are honored to take this question from Daniel, Daniel Awan, who writes, Hey, guys, love the show. Daily routine for a while now. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, now, we all know how great an actor Tom Hardy is and how great he is becoming. My question is, do we think he will be an Oscar regular nominee slash winner like Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Hanks, and Christian Bales? I hope so. Such talent. Thank you guys and keep up the great work. Well, I mean, Tom Hardy is a, I mean, he's a very gifted actor. There's no doubt. He's very, very skilled. Uh, and I think he's only getting better. But I'll say this. And he's got this movie coming out where who saw this coming? He's got two movies coming out where in one he plays Mad Max and in the other he plays Elton John. So go figure yeah. that. I mean, that's those awesome. are two really... Yeah. And I think playing these two movies back to back is going to give us a lot of insight into just how good he really is. But I will say this. Before we start having the conversation of will he become a regular Oscar appearance guy where like just every year we see his name come up on the nominee list and every once in a while winning... Let's get him one Oscar nomination first. Like before we start having this conversation of will he be a year in, year out Oscar regular, let's get one Oscar nomination to his credit first and then let's have that conversation. And we very well could see that in uh, with this um, with this Elton John biopic. I mean, that that's an Oscar bait kind of role. If he right. can nail that and convince us he's not the big badass tough guy, but rather this creative genius, um, then we could that could very well be his first Oscar nomination. But let's get that question settled first before we start putting him in the all-time greats, regular at the Oscars, Tom <laughs> Hanks, <laughs> Christian yeah. Bale, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio. Let's do that first. Anyway, uh, Schnapp, I know you're a fan of Tom Hardy. How, how do you see this? Yeah, you know, I'm excited to see this Road Warrior movie. Um, yeah, I don't want too. it to be delayed. It's been delayed a couple of years. Every every time I'm like, so when's it coming out? Oh, not another another year. This is <laughs> yeah. one of those things. Where and I'm they like, did. Come some, on. They recently did some reshoots, uh, like a month or two ago. They went back for some more reshoots. Right. So I'm excited as long as it's a great film, and it's cool that Tom Hardy's playing Mad Max. I mean, who would have ever thought that? But what a fantastic performance in Bronson! If you guys haven't seen Bronson, check it out. That's one of those movies where you're like, man, he should have been nominated for that, but. Yeah, he's a, he's a great actor. Uh, so, so far, he's played a lot of supporting roles. So you know, or you know, he hasn't been the lead lead except for a few like Bronson. Um, and the fighter. So we're gonna have to. What's that? He's kind of like fighter. a co-lead in the fighter. Right, right. Very good um, in that. So yeah, I mean, I think yeah, he'll he'll definitely get nominated. But let's see him get not like John said. Let's see him get nominated first. But yeah, he's gonna be around for a while, and he's a great actor. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of his new movies. So. Well, that'll do for all the questions we got today. You know, it's it's funny. Oh, we've already had Captain America. But we are now heading into that. We're getting ready to head into March or into May, I mean. Right. This is an exciting time to be a film fan, man. I mean, yeah. we have got, no, number one, we're probably going to have some Star Wars news here drop pretty soon, which is going to be probably May the 4th is probably going to be when it drops. For sure, something has to come out. May the 4th, absolutely. But we now we are getting into that home stretch now of when we are going to be seeing Godzilla, Spider-Man 2, X-Men Days of Future Past. There's just a big slew of amazing movies coming down the pipe that Every we're also... Week. Every week, at least yeah. two movies are coming out that you want to see. Yeah, and and we'll be doing a lot more uh, probably. Um, you, you probably noticed in the last couple of months, we haven't had many AMC spoiler reviews. Like in the past few months, we've only had really two. Uh, we right. had the, the Lego movie and we had Captain America uh, Winter Soldier. But you're going to start seeing more frequently because there's some bigger films coming out that we want to do spoiler reviews for. So, And the yeah. next up is going to be Spider-Man. 
too. So a lot of people have been writing and asking, hey guys, are you going to be doing an Amazing Spider-Man 2 spoilers review? The answer to that is yes. Uh, so that will be coming either the day the film opens on May 2nd, or it'll probably come out the next day on May 3rd, right around there. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. So yeah, anyway, that'll do it for us on this installment of AMC Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing in AMC theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all your theater, showtime, and and your movie ticket information. And also, don't forget, if you want an audio-only version of this show, we now put the AMC Mailbag podcast in the podcast feed for AMC Movie Talk. So if you subscribe to our iTunes podcast feed, you will now get AMC Mailbag in that audio-only podcast feed as well. Look in the description of this video for the Stitcher and the iTunes links there as well. And don't forget, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button and click the subscribe button. Become a subscriber to the AMC Movie News YouTube channel, keeping you up to date on everything in the world of movie news, including AMC Movie Talk, AMC Mailbag, AMC Coming Soon, AMC Spoilers, AMC Versus. We've got a Star Wars show coming that I told you about the other day. we got a few other surprises coming down the pipe here in the next couple of weeks. Can't wait to tell you guys about that. So, first of all, I want to thank my co-host today, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, Dr. Fun Fun, where can people find you online? Well, Captain Canada, people can follow me at Twitter, just at John Schnepp, and Instagram, at John Schnepp. Just uh, subscribe, click, and follow me, and look at some weird photos, and I've been throwing a bunch of weird stuff up on Twitter. So, you can find me there, and then if you can, go to schneppzone.com slash supermanlives and uh, donate to my documentary, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. Uh, if you put in $25 or more, you, you'll get credit in the movie as a finishing funder. So help me out, and I thank, thank you for all the support. And uh, you can find me on the various social media networks, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at John Campia. So thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until tomorrow, bye-bye. <laughs>